Today on Under the Scales, I'm extremely excited to have with me the dude of life. How are you, dude of life? I'm doing really good. Well, it's a beautiful fall day and I'm in the dude's incredible house with an amazing vista out here uh, overlooking the Hudson River. And it's incredible, way up in sort of northern New York. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. And um, I'm glad you finally made it up. Yeah. First, I've been to your place a couple times. Yeah. So. First time here. First time here. Yeah, it's very cool. Very cool. Funny, you know, I was thinking like driving up here, um, you and I uh, are, were involved with Trey before Fish. We were involved musically with Trey before Fish and are currently still involved with Trey musically. And I was wondering, there might not be too many other people you can say that about. No, I don't think so. Well, I don't think so. well, the, okay. So, so I did. I I was racking my my brain, and I came up with two that are definitely in that. And I wonder if you can. One of them is not a musician per se, oh. but makes guitars. Oh, but but Paul. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But he wasn't around. Oh, I guess he was. Well, I think he before was before. Fish. Yeah, because um, it, you know, so Trey lived in Burlington prior to Fish, and. I remember, and you had even just mentioned it, he had an Ibanez, and he had his eyes on a guitar, a time guitar. Well, and it's funny you mention that because I remember walking with Trey, and then suddenly he's like, oh, I have to, I have to talk to my friend, Paul. And he goes, we go into time guitars, and you know, I'm, I'm with my buddy, and next thing you know, he's like gone for 15 minutes, <laughs> 20 minutes, half an hour, uh -huh. 45 minutes. <laughs> Like, oh man, when is he coming out? But it was a cool shop, so there was, was a lot to check out. But little did I know, he was planning out his guitars Specifying. for the future, and and just learning about how they're made. And, right. And and at the time, I was kind of like, oh man, I, you know, after like an hour, I'd be like, thank God he finally came out. But you know, it it's just looking back, and you know, in retrospect, it's wild to think that. He was planning all this stuff so early. I know, I know. Yeah, I've even talked to friends about that. Like Trey knew, Trey knew before we all knew that he'd be he'd be doing this. Oh you know? yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but um, so so Paul, uh, I think uh, one of the very first guitars that Paul was involved with before he was just Paul Languedoc guitars uh, was a time guitar, and it was a mini electric. Do you remember that one? It was like a three quarter I... scale guitar. And uh, Trey brought it with um, John Fishman and Peter Catoni to Corfu in Greece. Yeah, now that was a little bit after, because we had taken a trip to Greece uh -huh. a year or two earlier. Uh -huh. And he had a three penny whistle that got stolen. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say stolen, it got lost. Okay. We lost a lot of stuff on the trip. I heard you lost an entire backpack of, of really well, well, amazing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Trey and Al were sleeping on a corner in Florence, Italy, and they kind of got, not mugged, but robbed. Okay. And there were nine rolls of film oh, no. that we had taken. And oh. so somewhere in Rome, maybe in, in someone's garbage dump, are nine <laughs> rolls of really cool prints. All right. Could... Well, well so this is part of the history that I didn't know. So, so the, the, the one trip that I do know about was when Peter Catoni, who's my my and Trey's friend from Princeton Day School, and John Fishman and Trey went to Greece. I was invited and, of course, couldn't come up with the cash and, and, or the time right, and, right. and didn't go. But so you're saying there was even a trip prior to that? There was. It was after uh, we graduated, Trey and I graduated from Taft, and our oh. graduation present was going to Europe, and we also went with our friend Al Corcoran. So the three of us went all through Europe, England, Italy. We went to Barcelona. Whoa. And then we went to, um, we, Trey and I saw David Bowie in Rotterdam. Oh my God. And then the last part of the trip, they were going to Greece and I was supposed to go, but then my brother passed away. So I had to leave early. Oh wow. And that's why they had to go to Rome so I could catch my plane. And 
Then they were sleeping on the corner, and then they had their stuff robbed. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, what were you talking about, the type of guitar that he had called a penny whistle? I don't know what that is. It's just a, it was a three-string, real mini, didn't make much sound, okay. but it had three strings, and it was easy to transport around. Okay. So he brought that with him, and... Interesting. And we were making some music. <laughs> and but I, I don't imagine too many recordings exist from back then. No recordings okay. at all. But one really funny story. We were in, in Rotterdam, and we were visiting, I don't know, there was like some school or orphanage. And anyway, these kids got stuck in a room, right? So... Trey and I were trying to open the door, but then we started singing, open the door. And all the kids were singing, open the door. And it turned into this amazing song. And then finally the door opens and the applause, it was, it was like at a concert. <laughs> open the door. And everyone was laughing. It was just fabulous. So the door was opened and... So rather than turn, you know, being locked into a room into a tragedy, uh, you and Trey turned it into sort of a comedy. It was and a, fantastic. A musical. It was really great. Yeah. That sounds just to me kind of that characterized Trey's uh, entire approach uh, to oh, life. absolutely. Which is like, you know, <laughs> something shitty's happening, write a song about it immediately. <laughs> it makes it so much better, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So um, basically, uh, the fish... People that are involved still with Trey, who were involved musically with him before Fish, include you, me, and then we also got through Paul Languedoc. But I was going to say John Fishman probably has to be in that because I think he was doing stuff with Trey musically before Fish was a band. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Okay. So that's, but would Mike Gordon also then? Or was Mike Gordon involved when it was Fish? Well, basically, I know Mike came on board when Trey put out songs looking for a bass player. Okay, so that's Fish. So so our yeah. little club that we're talking about now is four people large. That's pretty wild. <laughs> that's pretty wild. Um, Dial me back a little bit, uh, Steve, if you would. Um, uh, and I should let people know the dude of life's real name is Steve Pollock, if you didn't know that. Um, and I alternately call him, uh, in real life, I call him Dude and Steve and uh, use them interchangeably. You call me other things like uh, yeah. <laughs> no, life man. <laughs> yeah, yeah different, exactly. Different nicknames. Yeah, lots of nicknames. Uh, you know, spur of the moment ones. But I think I would I'd probably go with dude and Steve for that the works. most part. That works. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Steve, catch me up a little bit. Rewind a, a, a ways because uh, there's stuff that happened. Uh, I'm not 100 percent clear about uh, the history. So Trey left uh, Princeton area, Princeton, New Jersey area after 10th grade. And I kind of, I lost track with him until sort of first year of college kind of thing. But in that intervening time period, he went to Taft School, and that's where you met. And that's in Connecticut, right? That's in Watertown, Connecticut. Yeah, and it's a boarding school. It's a boarding school. So you were already there, and he showed up as a, as a junior, kind of? No, he showed up as a sophomore. Oh, okay. Okay. And you, so you were in the same grade as he? Same grade. And, and I remember when he... he Took up guitar fairly soon after he arrived, and he had this. And you remember this guitar is a Sunburst Ibanez. Yeah, sweet Ibanez. Was it kind of set up like a, an SG, a Gibson SG? It was. It was. Yeah, it wasn't the Fender version, the, the the Strat version. It was the SG simulation. I think so. And he just took to it really quickly. You know, he he wore the guitar around his neck all the time, and it was like a, a piece of him, you know? Yeah, yeah. I even, uh, in the, I remember things like Trey answering the phone with a guitar on. Now, how did you, so you're, you're at a boarding school, and did you room with him? Were you a roommate of his? I was not his roommate, but, uh, but we hung out a lot. Oh, okay. And, so uh, you took to him right away? Oh, yeah. And were you guys in a band, like, immediately, or what not happened? Not immediately, no. Um, at first, he was really into Genesis and... He he was not into the Grateful Dead. Neither was I at the beginning, at the ah, very beginning. Okay. And we had two, uh, three friends of ours who were really into the Dead. Ah. And they eventually got us into the Dead. Ah. Okay. Yeah, that's funny because uh, yeah, he definitely left being part of like to me uh, the progressive 
rock was our big thing. Uh, you know, we really loved Yes and Genesis a lot. And so Trey arrived w- with that sort of mindset. Oh, absolutely. And then, <laughs> then slowly over the course of time. You, you, you converted him. <laughs> we, we got converted, yes. <laughs> and it was a great conversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's like, you know, that helped, that a- aids people in understanding like his incredible music repertoire. Just like moving around as a kid, you know, you go from one pocket of possibly progressive King Crimson y, Robert Fripp, whatever type place to more like a Grateful Dead sort of fan base. No, and we also, we believed at the time it was important to like a lot of different kinds of music, yes. not just listen to one band all the time. Right. Because why do that? There's just so much great music out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't, yeah. you want to keep an open mind. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I almost feel like uh, that was sort of one of my failings was getting too focused. Like I would go in depth on some on a band or a person and have to go extremely that direction. But it was funny when when he was first learning how to play guitar. And I, I don't I don't think it was the first year. Maybe it was the second. Maybe it was as a junior. I, I forget. I, but he would start cranking it up. And he was playing pretty loudly at like one in the morning, two in the morning. Now, directly below him on a different floor was Eric Woolworth's room. And Eric was a good friend of ours, too. And Trey and Eric, Trey and Willie, as we called them, uh, they were on the same hockey team. But Trey would be blasting it at one thirty-two in the morning. And Willie would take his hockey stick and slam it on the ceiling. <laughs> say, Trey, shut the hell up! <laughs> but then... Now, fast forward 20 years, Willie's asking Trey to play at his arena because now Eric Woolworth is president of American Airlines Arena in Miami. Oh, my God. And he's, you know, he's like president of the Miami Heat, you know, <laughs> and, and Trey's, you know, Trey's one Trey. of the CEOs of this huge fish empire. <laughs> so how funny is that? That's you know? hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, where the... Were the rooms singles? Like, was Trey subjecting... No, most of the rooms were doubles. Was Trey subjecting then a roommate then, presumably, as well to this? Yeah, he, he had a... One of his roommates was uh, Vaughn Scully. Okay. I don't know who his roommate was at the time he was... Well, it's funny because you, um, you know, you I call you part of the Taft crew because, uh, you know, Trey's friends from the past... There's like a Princeton kind of crew, and then there's a Taft crew. There is, yeah. And I know a lot of the Taft uh, guys and, and, and women, um, but I don't think I ever met him, Scull- Scully, was it, whatever you yeah, call Yeah, uh, I don't know if Vaughn has ever been to a fish show. Okay, well, that would so, explain it. <laughs> he's, he's a great guy, but he, right. just, he just, you know. And then coincidentally, uh, Steve, um, my neighbor like three, four houses, depending how you count, away from me. Chip Chesbrough, I Yeah, know. your roommate. My roommate yeah. for, for one or two semesters. Eh? Chip, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a, great, he's a good guy. Yeah, <laughs> and now uh, we call him Charlie, but you guys called him Chip at the time. We did. Uh, that's funny. So, yeah. Small world department. Very small world. Yeah. So, um, all right, well, uh, accelerate us then um, through time into how you guys started a band. Well, you mean it, it Taft? Yes. Okay, so Trey had been in an earlier version of the Taft band, and then he, he got together with uh, Doug Parsons, Rob Gordon, and Dudley Taft, and, and I would come in and do some lead singing once in a while, and that band was called Space Antelope. I, I came up with that name, actually. <laughs> But when so you said the, you the name of the band was Space Antelope. Okay, when you say you would do some singing every once in a while, it wasn't your band. It was not my band. No. Oh. no. Okay. No, it was. Probably, I'd say it was Trey's band. Okay. Oh, but all right. but I I guest starred a lot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And uh, we had this thing called Vespers on certain nights. Is 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 a boarding school. So sometimes you'd have the chaplain talk about morality or something like that uh-huh. it, it was usually something pretty boring uh-huh. but then one night we came out of space antelope and we're doing this wild crazy psychedelic space and 
not that we were that good, but we were not preaching morals or anything like that. And people loved it because it was a break. Did you get painted as sort of anti-establishment in a way? I, I guess you could say that. Nice. But so, it was it was just it was just something we were, we we played a lot of dead songs. And again, it's so funny, you know. You play like Bertha or Scarlet Fire, and then again, flash forward, and you see Trey playing Bertha and Scarlet Fire with the Dead. With the Dead. So, <laughs> so it's almost it, it's almost surreal. It, it really is. It, it really is surreal when you see him there in the when, you know in Chicago. That's or, fantastic. Yeah, that was unbelievable. Um, yeah, I was glad you were there, and I was there, and everyone was there to see that. That was. Uh, that was amazing. I wouldn't have missed it. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Yeah, I got to admit, um, I was never, you know, Trey Trey took me to my first dead show. I was not a, a deadhead, and that came kind of later in life, like only to the point where I think I, I saw Jerry only five times. Well, so you got to see him at all. Uh, yeah, I'm very glad. You know, now I'm, I would call myself a fan, you know, a big fan. But right, back right. then, like, like we were talking about, I was kind of like, I was kind of caught in the David Bur- Bowie, um, Robert Fripp, Peter Gabriel kind of world. And do you remember Trey used to play Tubular Bells? Oh, yeah, Mike Oldfield. Mike Oldfield. He oh, loved that. That, yeah. that was fabulous. That oh, was really, yeah. really wonderful. Yeah, so that was one of the... Uh, that that album, the, the rumor was for that album that there was over uh, a thousand overdubs on that album. Because <laughs> Mike Oldfield played everything. So for... For those out there in Radio Land, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells. It's really phenomenal. In fact, listen to it right now. So uh, people might recognize that as the theme from, it might have been The Exorcist. I think it was The Exorcist. It was The Exorcist, yeah. <laughs> of course, that's why Trey loved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that reminds me of a story. I don't know. Uh, it involved one of your uh, one of your Taft buddies, Chris Cotshaw, one of your yeah. Taft friends. Seacat. Was coming <laughs> over, and Trey had a, uh, a suite in Vegas. And planned an elaborate hoax for Chris. And the hoax involved... That was the Children of the Corn. The Children of the Corn has a very malevolent guy named Malachi. And I forget the actor's name. But suffice it to say, it, either he came to a fish show and Trey met him one night. And then, you know, he was backstage and Trey said, Hey, would you mind taking part in this? We got this great idea. You know, we're going to screw with one of our friends. So Trey had Chris over, Chris Cottrell over, and they decided in this, you know, Vegas suite to watch Children of the Corn. And right in the most scary part, Trey got up and left. And then when he came back and sat down, it was Malachi who sat down in place of Trey next to Chris Cottrell. And... uh <laughs> <laughs> Apparently what happened was, Chris, you know, Chris had, you know, this was after a night of partying. So he wasn't entirely, you know, 100 percent sober and apparently turned and looked. And Malachi was like, like frowning at him malevolently l- looking at Chris <laughs> and during the, you know, children of the cord. Right, right. <laughs> That's and, great. and apparently he just sort of like, you know, he was expecting Trey and he saw malachi there he turned back and looked at the tv and uh you know trey and some other people were were hilariously you know hiding in a closet watching what happened chris apparently just sort of quietly got up and left that's right (laughs) it totally backfired it totally backfired he didn't scream or anything he just sort of decided you know what time to go to bed (laughs) a lot of trey's jokes backfire like that that is so funny (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I remember I remember bits and pieces of that. Yeah, that one's pretty elaborate. Um but uh where were we? So uh oh yeah, so um so Space Antelope became your guys your guys band you played uh was that junior and senior year of Taft? Right. Okay. Now when did you begin writing songs with Trey or when did you, you know, come like 
like like name your big fish songs, huge ones. Like they're like the cornerstone of fish. Uh, Susie is Fluffhead, Slave to the Traffic Light, Dinner in a Movie, Run Like an Antelope. Antelope. Uh, uh, right there. Uh, and then, you know, since then, uh, there have been quite a few others. But, oh, yeah, since then, yeah. After we graduated, then we went on that trip to Europe. Okay, this was, so So now we're talking like 1983. 83. We would be making up songs all the time, the way you make up songs with them as well. Very much and, so. And that's that was one of our big pastimes. That's it was like our not a club, but it's it's what we love to do it's just all the fun. time. Yeah, and, and anything became a song. Anything could be a target for a song. We were one time looking out at this green muddy water, and there was this kind of green moss, moldy moss covered stump. <laughs> and so we came up with this great song called "Green Stump." <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and we went on, we, we did a, like a 20 minute version of Green Stump and it, it was pretty epic. It's too bad we didn't record that. <laughs> <laughs> Green Stump. Green Stump, I love you. <laughs> it's very similar to, uh, and I don't know uh, how everyone knows this song. Like, I don't know if anyone ever heard about Green Stump, I love you. But for some reason, people know Guy Forge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the way that that came about was that I, I think it was like, I think David Abrahams said, by the way, you know, that tennis player, Guy Forget, it's really spelled Guy Forget. <laughs> and Trey just started cracking up. And we were on top of the rhombus in Princeton. Yeah. And Trey said, I never met a guy that I could not forget. But then for some reason, as we sang it over and over again, it, we, that just became, I never met a man that I could not forget except for. And that's how it happened. Guy right? Forget. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Exactly. So stupid, stupid things that turn into stupid songs. <laughs> and and that's and that's one of the beauties of writing music because there's no set way to do it. Right. And, you know, you can learn about the proper way in music school to write a song, but yes. And that parlays into like I want to hear the story of Meat Stick. How well, I, I would I would definitely say that we use the improper way of writing a song. Like if you <laughs> if you go down to Nashville to write a song, you're going to find a lot of people that are like versed in songwriting. And if you don't kind of fit into that, you know, that correct method. Oh, you're out the door. You're out the door. Right. And you got to kind of know what you're doing. Whereas, you know, you, me, Trey, a bunch of our friends, we were just putting down music like, you know, lucky, lucky now and then that we pressed record. You know what I mean? Because really songs were coming out as our words and they were our way of seeing the world. And it was never meant for crowds. It was never meant for for multiple people. But we would make each other laugh. And, it, and, and basically, exactly. if we could make each other laugh, it yes. turns out we could make a lot of other people yes. laugh. Yes. So Meat <laughs> Stick really was, uh, uh, you know, so ultimately uh, that song, really, I think every single one of the words, um, except for the chorus, was my friend Scott Herman had sent to me in an email, which I then forwarded to Trey because it was fantastic. You know, uh, unsure if I am still Corinne, unsure if you are still Corinne and all those things, a pain I can't identify. That whole thing um, was all Scott Herman's words. But the actual meat stick concept was in Austria. I was on tour. That's what I was getting yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was on tour with, uh, with Fish and it was one of those late nights where... Uh, you know, we had basically exhausted every single thing in the mini fridge, in the mini bar. And there was one thing left and it was like this hunk. It, it, if you're in Austria, meat is everywhere. Sausage is everywhere. It's unavoidable. It's inescapable. And just being Americans, you know, you're not really that tuned into meat that much. Well, right. it, certainly, it, it, especially nowadays. Like, it's almost, in a weird way, repugnant in a, in a way to us, like seeing just big hunks of meat everywhere. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> so we had avoided the meat stick, which was basically like this probably inch and a half thick, you know, 10 inch log of meat that was just like... But I heard it was really old and maybe even a little moldy or something. Uh, <laughs> well, it was wrapped... But, you know, wrapped Europe style where it's like not necessarily airtight. 
you know? Oh. It looked like it had been wrapped in someone's, like, you know, backyard or something. <laughs> Sounds tasty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so definitely not an airtight wrapping job. <laughs> it was just like you wonder where this thing came from. But, you know, 2 a.m., beggars can't be choosers. And Trey said, you know, it's time for the meat stick. And I said, are you sure? And, of course, there was also, like, a knife. There's, you know, uh, they wouldn't put, like, a sharp knife next to the hotel in, in America, the mini bar. But, no way. Um, oh, yes, there was a big <laughs> fucking knife there. So we hacked into it and ate it gleefully. And so the big song of the day was the Macarena. And um, there had been talk about doing uh, something to either get the attention of Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, you know, we we had some sort of a fun discussion about that on the bus. And the second that Trey and I started humming like a meat stick concept, we decided, oh, my God, this is it. We're going to create a dance and a, song, a meat stick song. And, uh, the new Macarena. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love and, that. Yeah, and uh, Paige's uh, wife at the time, uh, uh, Sophie, was there, helped develop that. And so you started doing the dance yeah. in that hotel room? Uh, yeah, yeah. Created the dance and, <laughs> the, the, and, and dance. the chorus. Yeah, and then later, I think, as a band, they, they pieced Scott's lyrics to that chorus and came up with the incredible song that it is today. Time for the meat stick, bury the meat stick, tear out the meat stick time. Whoa, shocks my brain. Whoa, shocks my brain. Time for the meat stick, bury the meat stick, tear out the meat stick time. Whoa, shocks my brain. Whoa, shocks my brain. So there you go. I mean, it's like that's that's the recipe to make a great song. Recipe for disaster <laughs> or a great song. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So uh, so now Space Antelope, you graduate, you go to Europe, you have an amazing time. You're playing a he's playing a three string penny whistle guitar. You come back and fish starts becoming a thing. So we, we came back and Trey and I both were wound up going to the University of Vermont okay. and there were three big dorms red wilkie and i forget what they're called but uh trey lived in one i lived in one and john fishman lived in another one so i recall meeting fishman with trey and not not at the same time like trey and fish had become friends and but i remember trey teaching fish these weird drum rhythms because, Trey teaching Fish the drummer. Yeah, was. because Trey was, as you know, Trey was a drummer before right. he was a guitarist. And he was teaching Fish these really wacky drum rhythms that if you take them out of context, they sound just really bizarre. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> but then now, when you hear him within the songs, it's like, oh, okay. That makes sense. That's, <laughs> that's the weird drum thing in Maze or whatever. Right, right. But at the time, it just seemed, this is really out there it was out there it really was and it was just fascinating that trey was really instructed fishman how to play these weird rhythms right so so trey and fish and you were chilling a lot in, in your early days at university of vermont right right and were you uh the persona of dude of life from space antelope or were you yet not dude of life Oh, no, I was already Dude of Life from high school. From Space Analog. From Space Analog. Oh, okay. So that, that's the kind of thing, it just, it, it, I just couldn't shake it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried a couple times, but it just didn't go away. <laughs> that's and, the kind uh, of thing that sticks with a guy. <laughs> you were talking about how you, um, you were kind of there witnessing Trey and John forming a little bit of a, a musical relationship together. But you were still there, and were you writing songs with Trey at the time, or what was what was happening there? I was. I, I'm always writing songs. So. Okay, right. But basically, uh, it, it was interesting because, yeah, Trey and Fisher forming this amazing musical relationship, and and Trey had a girlfriend named Kristen, and she lived in a different dorm, and there was this common room near her room and I vividly remember there's this little platform and he would be playing just jamming and she'd be sitting in a chair 
hanging on like every note. You know, it was, it was awesome to see. But then I'd come in and I'd sit down for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And it was really cool to see. But, you know, after a while I'd be like, oh man, I got to get some lunch, you know. So I'd go and go get some lunch and I'd come back an hour and a half later. <laughs> and they'd still be there. Chris would still be there. <laughs> and he was just playing away. But I guess the most... In a funny way, that's the first sort of like audience member Trey might have yeah, had. Yeah, I think so. I that's think pretty so. hilarious. But that's then, great. you know, basically, I mean, the most amazing part about this is when he's playing in front of 20,000, 30,000, 100,000 people, whatever it is, he's doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, and, and that was... That was really special. Just that's amazing to see. So you could see for that. Oh, of course, of course. You could see like Trey, the guitarist, on stage, the performer, beginning to form. Absolutely. And did you kind of? Uh, were you also thinking? I mean, because you're, you and I are extremely different. You seek the limelight, and I do not. I absolutely do not. I don't want it at all. And I like when I was the front man of Amphibian, I was the most uncomfortable front man ever. Well, so I see, I see it differently. I see that you want the limelight, and I don't want the limelight. What? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, you're definitely kidding. <laughs> that was exactly polar opposite right there. But um, uh, so, uh, so, so you, uh, did you have in the back of your mind, like, you know, shit, we're making a band and, and, and Trey's the guitarist in the band? Or, or were you thinking like, hey, I, you know, uh, I'm happy to, to sit and watch Trey go nuts uh, and you were going to be part of it? Or were you just thinking, you weren't even thinking any of those thoughts? You were just sort of just uh, Trey's yeah, friend? Uh, th that, that last point is I really wasn't thinking any of those thoughts. It was just, it was really the embryonic stage. Right. So it was too early. Okay. For any of that. Really. So there wasn't like a band coalescing really yet. No. Okay. No. Okay. So this is early UVM. Because exactly. late UVM, well, there actually wasn't, Trey actually left UVM. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello, listeners. This is Tom with a brief mid-podcast message to remind you that I'm always looking for fish-related stories and topics, and I'm always looking for new subjects and new people to interview. If you feel like you might be able to contribute to this podcast, go to underthescales.com and click the Tell Your Story button. I read every legitimate submission, so don't hesitate. Follow our Twitter to stay up to date at Under the Scales. Now back to the show. Tell us then about the, the origin of Slave to the Traffic Light and Antelope, and h how did these happen? It's when I, I was living in, at 202 and a half Pine Street with Trey. And Trey and Kristen were living together, and I had a different room. And and that that should be a landmark, 202 and a half Pine Street in Burlington. They <laughs> should put up signs. They should have like a tour bus going by. There. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I just came up with some songs at that point in time, and and little did I know that they'd turn into these, you know, California redwoods, you know. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, you know, we all have, we've all written a lot of songs that you know they, they turn into little saplings that that die on the spot, but wither and die. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Jennifer dances. Poor Jennifer dances. <laughs> yeah, she's gaining some steam now. You know? <laughs> um, uh, all right. Well, let me. Uh, uh, okay. Since you said that, that's a good point. The funny thing is, I guess then you guys never sort of did. Did you guys ever like sit and record as a hobby? Because that was something that I definitely had with Trey from the early days. Just sitting endlessly with a deck and pressing record and going nuts. And we, then... we didn't do that as much. Okay. I mean, we did it maybe a couple times, but not, okay. not to so the same you, extent that you did it. Right. So you're much more of a in-the-moment songwriter. Like, here's a song. Yay, yeah, we're creating a song. But as far as documenting it on tape magnetically... That wasn't really something that you guys were. That's true. Okay. So you had to be, the reason I asked that is because to me, one of the very, very first versions of Slave to the Traffic Light and Antelope was after that first year of University of Vermont when Trey and I re-met 
in his dad's basement. I think he recorded those quintessential versions, and I just happened to be there. Right. And that you was... you wrote them, but I actually like said, seen the city, seen the zoo, traffic light won't let me through, and I actually said, uh, Rai Rai Rako Marco Escondo. Yeah. And that was those are big parts of the song. So it, well, I mean, you know, that's again, yeah. it, it's, you can never put into a little square box how these songs come together. You can't compartmentalize it at all. And it's really funny that now you and I are here, you know, talking right, about right. it. And, and yet we didn't, honestly. But those were, those were your first songs, right? That was my first contribution oh, I mean, in a weird way to, to, to Fish, if not counting Wilson, which was or, really the um, first. And no, no, no. Mackie Super Policeman may have been the first. Or um, what's it called? The other one with... I Am Hydrogen? No, with... There's the, some really early ones. Under the Microscope... Uh, uh, Golgi. Golgi. Yeah. yeah. That was, how yeah. old were you when you wrote that? Well, those are all in the same sort yeah. of time. Yeah. Golgi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that goes way back. Golgi goes way back. <laughs> Golgi and Wilson, I would say, were probably pretty pretty darn early. Although Mackie Super Policeman, the words for that were way, way, way earlier than that. But it didn't become a song. Ah, until okay. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> but so, uh, yeah, so, it's, been, it's been quite a ride. <laughs> yeah. No, no, absolutely. So that was Slave and Antelope. Now, w were you also putting all in that same category, uh, all the ones that ended up on Junta, Dinner and a Movie? Um, what were the other ones that you now, mentioned? Fluffhead, uh, you know, Fluffhead was about my brother, my oldest brother, Dick, who passed away in 83, and we were in Europe at the time when oh. he passed away, and that was, obviously that was very traumatic for me, yeah. and then the next year in college, I was writing... A song and it was called Fluff it at the time I didn't know that I had written a song about him ah because sometimes this stuff is so deeply buried in your subconscious yeah and it was just a way for me to just get it out of my system you had a cathartic release and even if it's funny and seems to be making fun of it it's not at all well yeah I it's mean because but that's another part of it it's yeah. sometimes you know when you're dealing with tragedy sometimes yes. I didn't realize this for myself but I was trying to put some humor into the situation so it would lessen my depression right to alleviate what you were feeling and right what i what i came to realize over time is that it was cathartic for me but yeah. it also turns out it's cathartic for thousands of people who hear it oh definitely for, it has the same same reaction well uh, you know not to not not to go too too deep on it but fluffhead actually he died of a, a form of cancer he and, and he actually had were you talking about his hair coming off I was and you know these days a lot of people will shave their head bald yeah. and my brother for some reason he kept these fluff balls on his head and <laughs> I was I was like 18 or 19 it's for me it was very it disturbed me it was it was it pissed me off and I, I see I, yeah I was like, you know, get those fluff balls I didn't say this to right him, but, but that's what it, you're thinking I, I hated seeing these fluff balls just just shave him. Just I, I hated. You didn't like the it. way he looked, and it was embarrassing. It was a reminder, like he's deteriorating or something, right in front of that your too. eyes. That oh, too. That's too bad. That's too bad. So, so yes, yeah, so I, I was singing that from the heart. Get right. those fluff balls off your head. <laughs> 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 but yeah, you know. So I, I, I well, it sounds pain. It's it's painful, and yet it's wonderful too. Because when I hear it. Especially that very end. It's kind of like celebrating his life. I hope you think that way. Anyway. Well, it, it, in my mind, I feel somehow his spirit is in that song. He's smiling and, when, and, when he and hears I it. think, yeah. I, you know, and again, it's part of the mystery of of songs in general. But yeah, yeah, I, I think that that his his spirit is, is in that song. The essence of him is in that song. And right. That's, and he really brought so much joy into my life. And right. So hopefully. And he was your oldest brother? He's my oldest, oh, by, okay. by 15 years. Well, yeah. I, for the people that didn't know, you know, the spiritual side of Fluffhead, um, there's no denying the spiritual side of a, a more uh, contemporary song of yours, uh, The Architect. So right. what, what, are you a religious person? Because to me, it's like... You know, I've I, I believe... I'm, I'm not... I'm not, uh, I'm not a huge... You're not a traditionalist. I'm not a... I'm not a huge believer in organized religion. So you're I, Jewish. I am Jewish, and I I never got bar mitzvahed, but but my my kids, my my son got bar mitzvahed. I just think that very often religion serves to divide people more than it 
serves to bring them together. Right. So I, I try not to have that happen in my life. Yeah. You've never gone, you've never, to me, been an over the top religious type person. No, I haven't. Although when you listen to the architect, you're definitely toasting uh, uh, well, it's, a creator. It's it's the spirit. It's the, the force, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Okay. And and I think most religions have the, something representing that force, right? In some fashion or form. Uh, and 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 while my beliefs probably go somewhere that direction as well, uh, you know, my only way of commemorating that that force has been to say God never listens to, <laughs> <Yeah. what> <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, sort of the opposite, <laughs> but not necessarily what I meant. You know, especially as I get older, I want to become more friends with. You know, in case there is an afterlife. And you don't get a <laughs> refund if you overpray. <laughs> I'm definitely not overpraying, so I'm not looking for a refund. <laughs> okay, so more contemporary song, Steve. Uh, one that really, really resonates with me. And also sort of, in a way, uh, references uh, not the architect by name, but sort of the spiritual aspect of just the way that we live these days and and you know what we find valuable is the show of life and it sounds to me like you know the dude that wrote antelope set the gear shift for the high gear of your soul is uh you know still you know retrospective in a way do you can you come up with those lyrics just offhand that's a beautiful song oh thanks sure um it's no easy road the struggle and strife we find ourselves in the show of life. What's on your schedule? What's on your plan? Do you ever ignore what you don't understand? That's it. That's it. What did you mean by that last part? Do you ever ignore what you don't understand? It's making yourself think about what, you know. Well, sometimes we're hit with perplexities that completely confound us and then Sometimes it's easier to just ignore them than to face them. <laughs> yes, and, and and dig deeper, right? Right. You're saying, yeah. So, so it's always been like, you know, set the gear shift with you. It's always like, you know, take that one notch further. You're revealing this advice to your fellow human to set the gear shift for the high gear of your soul and to explore a little bit further, go a little bit deeper and raise a glass. You're celebrating life almost in every single one of your songs. And also at the same time though, it, it, it's really I'm kind of giving advice to myself, you know, and it's so reminding you to celebrate. It's life. reminding myself to do that too. Right, well, it's always a good thing. I think gratitude is an amazing, amazing thing. And I find like my, my lyrics sometimes uh, might be a little bit darker, like not kind of examining another side or or reasons why i might not be feeling great at the moment or something along those lines but for me like when uh you know uh in roses are free when they say drop it into third when you know you're going to climb that hill that to me exemplifies the dude of life and you're th uh, that you're right that's kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> awesome all right well uh now we're into phase two of this interview, Steve, and we've moved from uh, Studio A in Steve's basement to Studio B, not too far away, about 10 minutes down the road, into Charlie's basement. We'll explain that in a moment, but we're really here because we want to talk about some collaborative music and some current music that Steve and I and Charlie are involved with. And that all started, Steve, Correct me if I'm wrong. Did that start in 2009 in India? Before India, we'd always been, we we knew a lot of the same people, but we never really hung out that much together. But then once we were in India, we uh, we started having the best time. And that's when we took things to a whole new level. We really did. We, we uh, uh, for whatever reason, maybe our trailers <laughs> were next to each other or whatever, but we spent we spent a whole lot of time together at that particular show, and that was that was a phenomenal festival. And, and, and you have a photo or two to, yeah, that I think you could post that will show <laughs> that. Yeah, I'll put the photos up as evidence to that. <laughs> but um, uh, suffice it to say uh, that yes, we we started hanging out quite a bit more, and uh, you know, both of us with a lot of musical ideas uh, decided to take a crack at writing songs together even though you know in the past our ideas went directly to Trey we decided to write a little bit and um, 
So one of the first songs we wrote together is called A Better Place. Do you remember that one, Steve? Yeah, and, and I, uh, I drove down to your place in Princeton, and, and we just... Uh, you were trying to get to a better place. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so... And, and it was a better place. That was, that was an awesome place. The beauty of what we did, it was just very basic. I mean, you were on piano... I was on guitar, and it, you know what? It, it, we just found the spirit of the songs, and we just had a blast. Yeah, and Steve brought these words, and uh, I, I'm not positive if you brought the chords too, because you often bring like an entire song. But for whatever reason, uh, right away we sort of fell into the rhythm where I could add a bridge to one of your ideas. Well, in this or, song, that's true, but then there were other songs where you brought in the words right and right so yeah it, it was it was really a nice collaborative it, yeah thing it was going very on. collaborative and i gotta say i've you know i've tried to write with scores of people in the past and very very often i immediately you know bump into a, a roadblock where i just realized all right i'm not gonna be able to write with this person and and you and i immediately like fell into a pretty cool rhythm so we wrote this song better place this was our first song that we wrote and i want to play it for you right now That's a great one. I love how that kind of that harmony just sort of like evolved out of nowhere. It was very cool. Yeah. And then there's a song called Too Far Gone. We'll also play. This next one has um, uh, lines that you you came with, Steve. And it, it, this sort of represents, uh, again, we had talked about your your worldview uh, to me, this is—I I don't know if I have a worldview, but <laughs> well, this is the one. You know, you know the antelope we were talking about. Slip it, you know, slip it in gear and and keep moving, kind of thing. This one, this one's like keep keep the party going and, till the break of dawn. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's about going out with your friends and having a, an awesome time. And sometimes you have to leave reality behind, right? So, at times, and and like like you said earlier, uh, keeping the torch burning. You know. Keep it burn, burning all night if if necessary. Of course. Even when you're too far gone. Keep the party going till the break of dawn. You found a place where you belong. The music in your head, let it keep playing on. Studio B, which is basically Charlie's basement. Charlie de Saint Fal is the bass player, and he's in Steve's band. But he also played a couple songs uh, with us, which we're going to play in a moment. But Charlie, you had said a couple cool things about this song, which you guys now play live, right? Well, what's your view on this one? Well, I, I, um, I think there are, you know, there are a couple of things about it. I love the uh, 
the idea of keeping the fire burning. And it's the energy that you get into in that space that you find um, hanging out with your buds and finding a place where you belong. So it's sort of a, a meeting of kindred spirits. <laughs> You know? <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. It's kind of like... I like that. Yeah. It, it's sort of what you look for, um, and especially like in a festival atmosphere. It's kind of yeah. why I am always want to hang around with you guys, because it seems like we're trying to find that lost flame, you know, every single night. The fish concert's <laughs> over, and yet we're still looking for it, because we know it's burning somewhere. And often we find it. We and find then, it. And somehow. Then, somehow. We, yeah. we and find then it. either that or it finds us. <laughs> We've been burned also by oh, the yeah, flame. That's right. That's true. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true too. <laughs> so, so this next song, "Night," has uh, lyrics. It's basically like this long tome I wrote, and it's it's very, very evocative of the you know kind of the 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 night versus dark, the good versus evil. I don't really know where I was going with it, but. Uh, you know, I, I gave it to Trey, and I think he wasn't super. I, I don't think it really resonated with him. And I played it or showed it to you, Steve, and you immediately just like I remember your eyes lit up. You were just like, well, on on its own. I mean, it really stands out as as a beautiful poem. Oh well, thank that's you. How, that's how I see it. I mean, well, well, me too. In fact, I kind of was like, this. There's something really cool about this, and I really want this to turn into something. And to that end. Uh, you you and Charlie came over and we, we decided to, you know, kick it up a notch and went to a professional studio. We went and we included my friend Anthony. So Anthony Cryzon, I should say, was uh, in the Spin Doctors and he was in my band Amphibian. And he has a really cool studio and he's got tons of guitars and vintage amps. And uh, any time that you're there, like a, a really amazing musician might walk through and uh you know play a track with you so we just we just went nuts in his studio with this song oh yeah. we had a great time there and and the, the magic was happening it was fun right was definitely a great place to be and he's a fantastic a great dude and, a, and an unbelievable musician great musician yeah so we're honored to have him on this track and uh we'll play it you're talking about too far gone and you know and how that talks about the fire and then you know night um is sort of the other side of it and the reason you kind of want to get back into that fire i don't know it's a, anyway no no i agree it's you like, know what i mean but it's a space i've definitely been in i understand <laughs> it you know? there, there's a lot of like uh, there's there's images in this that are like you know you're searching again kind of searching for for light to fill the space or you're also sort of like left in the desolate place without light you know and 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 yet uh this person who's singing the song wants to embrace the you know the spirit of that night and and sort of like almost saying all right well screw light uh you know now i'm just gonna go with the dark right, right. And the last For line sure. is most of space is always night it, yeah in most of space right. it's always night right. well that, yeah that's, like, that, that sums it up right well, <laughs> and to appreciate you know they're kind of like opposite sides of the same coin Right? And to be able to appreciate one side, you have to appreciate the other. And 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 actually, yeah. So the the image about the space, when you think about it, to appreciate day and night, you have to be on a planet. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> right, of course. Right. Because it has to go around and around yeah. and around a spinning planet gotcha. to get day and night. Yeah. When you're in space, you're though, it's just unless you happen to be close to a star, you're in night. You're in permanent night. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, a couple of items before I play the song Second Sight in its entirety. Under the Scales comes out the first three Mondays of every month, which means we won't be back until January 2nd. So I want to wish everyone a happy and safe new year. Maybe I'll see you at the Madison Square Garden shows. The full songs written by me and Dude featured on this episode are also available on his and my SoundCloud. His is Dude of Life 17, mine is Thunderburn, burn as in flame. One correction, Trey's Ibanez guitar was set up like a Les Paul, not an SG, as I had said. And as for missing items, there's a three-quarter scale electric time guitar out there in the world somewhere, owned by Trey originally. If you have it or know where it is, contact me. Similarly for his Ibanez, although that would be harder to verify. Also, the nine rolls of film missing from 1983 in Italy.
Oh, sacred demon of the night, please set me on the path that's right. Although my soul with you shall roam, the road will lead my body home. For I once lived just fine above, and daylight bathes the world in love. Forgiving are the moonlight sins, nightmares fade on gentle winds. To those who feed on sunshine as their every need And care disperses on the breeze While I in shadow choose to freeze If asked to fight I'd join the fray Against the soon approaching day Though here and there are specks of light Most of space, it's always night. For I was too was swept away by waves of happiness by day. The waters rise, the river swells. No one hears the distant bells. Soon the torrent floods my brain and heals the weak, but not with the same. Close your eyes, it soon will pass Darkness rules again at last